So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Kim Hosen. I'm the executive director of the Prince William Conservation Alliance. And we are delighted to have all of you here today and to have such a fabulous speaker who is gonna share information about one of our most important resources, the Occoquan Reservoir and its watershed. The watershed area for the reservoir actually covers 590 square miles and it includes the 1,700 acre Occoquan Reservoir, which as we all know, serves as a boundary between Prince William County and Fairfax. Prince William and Fairfax have taken different approaches to protecting the reservoir. In Fairfax County, we have just 25 homes that are along the reservoir, the shoreline, and 5,000 acres of public parkland, which make a really nice buffer and a fabulous area that's so appreciated for its recreation opportunities. They also downzoned 41,000 acres in 1982 to protect the water quality there, and they have an overlay district that raises the bar for stormwater and other environmental requirements. However, in Prince William County, we have 450 homes along the shoreline and only 70 acres of public parkland, which is Lake Ridge Park. But we did promise protection for the headwaters area, which is Gainesville and Noakesville, pretty much the rural crescent. And um, right now that policy is up for discussion. So we're really glad to have Dr. Souza here tonight so that we can learn a little bit more about what's at stake and what matters. Um, Dr. Souza, has 35 years of lake and reservoir management experience. He's a past president of NALMS and PALMS, a founding partner and president of Princeton Hydro from its inception in 1998 until his retirement in 2019. He's part of the faculty at Rutgers, the Office of Continuing Public Education and an adjunct professor at Temple University. So we are so delighted to have him here and, um, and hear what he has to say, which I think um, is really, you present in a way that's really easy to understand, which I appreciate very much. And so I'm going to just turn the program over to Dr. Souza. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for having me uh, this evening. Um, and yeah, you know, what I would like to do is uh, really go through this presentation. I'll stay on. I'm going to try to keep this to about 50 minutes. And uh, so we have plenty of time afterwards for questions and answers. And I'll stay on as long as you all uh, would like. But yeah, you know, tonight, what we're going to talk about is really the benefits of watershed management uh, as it applies to source water protection and how that all uh, really fits into the equation for Aquaquan uh, Reservoir. And, you know, I'd, I wanted to start off the presentation with uh, these quotes from folks that had spent time either on the reservoir or in the park uh, system and, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, you know, getting sort of like that, that, that foundation started in terms of why this is such a, a unique and valuable resource. Um, so what I'm going to cover uh, this evening is really something that uh, I've seen over my 35 plus years of working with lakes and reservoirs. And that's how water, uh, water quality ends up being impacted as a result of watershed development. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, how uh, the water quality of the reservoirs uh, can be directly affected by watershed development, some of the benefits of land preservation and conservation, and also some of the benefits of proper stormwater and septic management. So as you know, Kim pointed out, uh, we're dealing with a water body that's about 1,700 acres in size. Uh, it's got a maximum depth of about 65 feet, a mean depth of about 13 feet. Um, and it supplies about 40% of the daily water, uh, drinking water supply for uh, around 2 million residents in the area. And although there's some recreational use of the reservoir proper, it's, you know, there's limited boating as you know, but it's not open to swimming. And this is just, you know, uh, you know for everybody's uh, benefit, just a, a graphic showing uh, the very, uh, 
a long, narrow nature of the reservoir. And that's typical for flooded river valleys and for many of the reservoirs in this part of the country uh, that were uh, basically formed by either a, a flooding, uh, a, a erecting a dam and flooding a river valley or erecting a dam and flooding a large expanse of, uh, of wetlands. The uh, reservoir watershed, again, as Kim pointed out, uh, we're looking at about 340,000 acres. And there's essentially two main sub watersheds the Bull Run sub watershed, which encompasses about 119,000 acres, and then the Okaquan Creek watershed that covers about 220,000 acres. But the big thing here, in front, as a lake manager, a reservoir manager, this is something that I always look at, like right up front. You know, what's my watershed to reservoir ratio? And here it's very high. I mean, we have a large watershed. And even though the reservoir is fairly large, uh, it's, it's essentially dwarfed by the size of the watershed. And when we have uh, watershed to reservoir ratios that are greater than 20 to 1, and here are at 200 to 1, uh, we're in a situation where, uh, you know, the reservoir can be greatly affected, its water quality can be greatly affected by what's happening in the watershed. Now, as Kim pointed out, I, I'm a past president of the North American Lake Management Society, as well as the Pennsylvania Lake Management Society. But NOMS came up with this really cool sort of like byline back in 2008 that a lake is a reflection of its watershed. And, you know, more than just like a pretty picture like this of the reservoir on a good day when it is a true reflection of what's happening on, on you know, on its, uh, of its shorelines. Uh, we have conditions, and this is a you know picture that Nikki shared with me, of the of the reservoir. Uh, you know when it's turbid uh, as a result of a lot of sediment loading that has come in uh, that has come into the reservoir uh, following a storm event. And again, this is a reflection of what's happening in the watershed. So when we think of it, you know we can think of our watersheds of having you know a big, uh, a, char a, a large characteristic of the quality of our reservoir. So the quality of our watershed is often reflected in the quality of our reservoir. And that's because there's you know, this really tight, intimate connection between reservoir water quality and what's happening within the watershed. And this is because the watershed is going to be responsible for the hydrology of the reservoir, how much water enters it on a daily basis, seasonal basis, annual basis. Also, the type of pollutants, whether we're talking about nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen, sediment, uh, or various contaminants, road salts, petroleum hydrocarbons, uh, all of those contaminants and pollutants originate from the watershed. So you can start to understand how you know, the quality of the watershed starts to affect the quality of the water within the reservoir. Now, a lot of you have probably seen graphics such as this, but it, it helps give you an idea of why these changes can occur within a reservoir or a lake that's, that uh, is subject to a lot of watershed development. And hydrology plays a really big role in the trophic state or how productive a, a particular water body is. And if we look at you know, the figure to the left, you know, here we have a fairly undeveloped watershed and only 10% of the rainfall that hits the ground actually runs off. The majority of it uh, is infiltrated or lost via evapotranspiration as a result of photosynthesis. When we take a look at a developed watershed, and as we'll talk about a little bit later, we're not, we don't necessarily need, need to have a watershed that is the, you know, a fully developed, a highly urbanized uh, area. This starts to happen in suburban and even semi-rural type of uh, developed conditions. However, uh, when you look at a, you know, a more urbanized watershed, uh, about 55% of that precipitation actually ends up running off because of the impervious cover, the amount of pavement uh, that's present, rooftops, compacted soils, et cetera. There's also another side to this because uh, in addition to the water that's running off uh, in our undeveloped type of scenario, uh, a lot of that precipitation has the opportunity because of the uncompacted soils, 
the deep root system of trees and the other native vegetation to allow a lot of that precipitation to actually work its way down through the soil horizon and feed the surficial aquifer as well as our deeper aquifers. Uh, conversely, when we get into more uh, developed watersheds, what we see is that there's a significant reduction in the amount of precipitation that can make it down into the ground and constantly feed that either shallow aquifer or the deeper aquifer. Now, as I said, you know, these changes start to occur uh, even with a slight amount of development. It doesn't take a tremendous amount of urbanization to start to see problems of this nature in terms of changes to the hydrology of a system. This is a, you know, a, a really informative slide and just like showing that you know, the big difference, we have a one inch rainstorm and that's not a lot of rainfall. Although a one inch rainstorm can be enough to create some localized flooding problems. It's far less than what is considered the one year storm, which is closer to about two and a half to three inches of rainfall over 24 hours. So a one inch rainstorm is about a typical rainstorm that you would get in the spring and summer. And as you can see, you know, when we have a wooded area uh, with a you know, well-developed forest with a, a, you know, a, a really healthy understory, uh, only about 1,400 gallons of runoff is produced from that one inch rainstorm. Conversely, when we have a parking lot, there's 100% impervious cover, uh, we end up generating about 26,000 gallons of runoff. So it's a big difference between how much runoff uh, is generated uh, as a result of impervious cover. And although this is the extremes, uh, you can start to see these big differences in the amount of runoff, even at lower levels of development. So watershed development definitely, you know, as you know, as Pogo has said, you know, we we have met the enemy and he is us, and that's really because watershed development can trigger a whole host of problems. And I've seen this time and time again. Um, it starts off, uh, you know, at the hydro with the hydrology changes in hydrology, and it's because of generating more stormwater runoff, and that's the typical primary driver of water quality problems. The amount of runoff that's being generated uh, and, and with that, the amount of pollutants, nutrients and sediment that is mobilized and transported via tributaries, whether they're creeks or streams or rivers into our receiving system. And in this case, the Okokon uh, Reservoir. Add to that then, you know, non-sewered communities and you have septic systems that can also create uh, an impact to water quality. And this is an impact that is transmitted via the groundwater. And then on top of that, we can layer onto that agricultural, industrial and wastewater uh, uh, impacts that result both by point discharges. And this would be like an individual pipe emanating say from a given industry. Uh, and it could be actually even non-contact cooling water coming from, say, for instance, a data center. Uh, and then you have wastewater uh, that's being generated from industrial facilities or uh, municipal stormwater facilities. Along with that, the non-point discharges that come from all that impervious cover that is associated with industrialized land. Uh, and then also the uh, uh, non-point source discharges that are coming off of agricultural land. So, you know, you put that all into one big ball and it starts to become a big problem for water quality. And it's all related back to what's happening in our watersheds and the degree of development. So what's the problem? As I mentioned, it all has to do primarily with changes in hydrology. And that starts just by land clearing. As we saw before, I mean, trees do a fantastic job of sucking up precipitation and, and keeping that water in place. Uh, and along with that clearing of vegetation, you end up compacting soils. And as the soils become compacted, they become more and more equivalent to like an impervious cover. It's like a pavement. Um, a lot of people don't realize that lawns, typical suburban lawn, uh, is almost as compacted as a parking lot because of repeated, first off, just the construction of the homes and the amount of compaction that occurs at that point, and then repeated compaction over time uh, because of mowing, et cetera, et cetera. You can get some very acute 
problems during the construction phase, and it's typically reflected in high amount of sediment loading. So you get a lot of soil that washes off of construction sites. And then over time, as you have more development, whoops, go back, more development, that leads to more runoff. And as we'll see, I'll show you some slides in a minute that actually you know, uh, illustrate this, but we end up with more volume. So this flooding, we end up with more volume that's coming at us quicker, faster flows. That causes scour and erosion of stream bed and banks. We end up with more volume, which is carrying more pollutants. And then again, layer on top of that, other sources of pollution that is associated with either point sources and non-point sources that are not necessarily stormwater related, but are a function of land development. So we'll look at some of these problems. Uh, a lot of you are probably aware of this, but you know, over 70% of the water quality problems nationwide, it's a result of non-point source pollution. It's not because of some type of industrial discharge. It's because of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and the, the runoff that comes off of our lawns, our streets, our parking lots, our rooftops, et cetera, uh, conveys pollutants that then in turn uh, via stormwater uh, ends up creating impacts to surface water systems, whether it's a lake, a river, a stream, a reservoir, or a wetland uh, ecosystem. Those impacts, uh, we feel those in terms of lost recreational uses, but we also feel that in terms of impacts to potable water. And when, you know, I, I deal with a lot of reservoirs, I still do, even in my semi-retired state, um, and that increases the cost to produce quality potable water. So these are impacts that we feel uh, directly as well as indirectly. As I mentioned, you know, in terms of stormwater, uh, you know, every single storm represents some type of an environmental risk. You can look at these extreme events like we've just had up here in New Jersey at the beginning of the month, uh, about 11 inches of rainfall in about four hours of time fell in my town and created, I mean, a, a chaos as well as an unbelievable amount of, of property damage and loss of life. Those are acute impacts and, you know, they're associated with these extreme events, the 100 year storm, six inches of rain over 24 hours, seven inches of rain over 24 hours, as well as some of these flashy storms uh, that we've seen more and more frequently. But then, you know, from my perspective, a lot of the impacts that we see to reservoirs and lakes is really a function of these chronic impacts that are attributable to the smaller, more reoccurring storm events. And these can be a half inch, one inch rainfall events that occurred like, you know, once a week, uh, perhaps uh, is that, that often. And they start to have these uh, chronic impacts that are uh, evidenced in terms of more nutrients, more sediment, uh, more stream bank and bed erosion, things along those lines. So hydraulic impacts, again, this is a function of water coming at me too quickly. And with this, this is a rate-based thing. And you end up, if you go out and you, if anybody have, has walked the streams that enter the reservoir, you see evidence of erosion, you see evidence of bank subsidence, that's directly a function of water traveling too fast through that stream channel. It's a function of rate. So hydraulic impacts occur as a result of watershed development. Here's a, you know, a picture that, that uh, Nikki sent me of some erosion along uh, the perimeter of the reservoir. Uh, again, a hydraulic impact related uh, uh, loss of soil uh, and the uh, cleaving off of a portion of that shoreline. We have hydrologic impacts, and this is a volume issue. So this gets back to flooding, and that's the most common uh, you know, hydrologic impact that we think of. But as I mentioned before uh, in that graphic, when we start to lose the ability to infiltrate water and recharge our, our surficial and deep aquifers, that can also have a big detrimental impact on the uh, quality and the, the consistency of water that's entering our reservoir from, from our surrounding creeks and streams. So this is a function of either too much water, a volume related thing, or too little water. 
Now, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about those ground, groundwater impacts, because this is something that we don't really think a lot about. We think a lot about flooding, but you have to also think about it on the other side of the equation, because every time we have a rainfall event and we have a forested wetland, or I mean a forested area, or an area that has not been you know, highly developed, as I said before, that precipitation can soak back down into the ground. And in the soil, it's like a big sponge. And slowly over time, that water is released as interflow back out into the streams. And that provides the base flow uh, that is important to the quality of the streams, as well as to the quality of the reservoir. Uh, so we can end up with a loss of recharge because of impervious cover. That just means you know less groundwater uh, resulting in less base flow. And any of you that have walked, you know, a suburban stream or an urban stream, and you see evidence like this of a very, very wide stream channel, but in the center of that channel, there's a very small, what they call the wetted channel, where water is actually flowing on during non-storm conditions. That's evidence right away that you have an impaired watershed, that there's been a lot of development there is improper, inadequate stormwater management, and that's leading to the downcutting of that of that stream channel. That's totally a function of bed and bank erosion and scour, and that's a hydraulic problem uh, that's exacerbated by additional volume. So, uh, and then when you add to that the lack of base flow, you start to see these big differences between that wetted channel and the actual width of the stream, which is defined by the two year storm, which is a fair amount of rain. You know, that's around three and a half inches of rain over 24 hours. Uh, but this is what defines the banks and the width of the channel. This is how, you know, the channel is defined, but this is what's happening during our base flow conditions. And when there's a big discrepancy here, I always look back to see how much development has occurred in the watershed. Groundwater impacts, as I mentioned before, can also uh, you know, uh, uh, end up showing up as contamination. Uh, you say, okay, wait a minute, if you have a lot of impervious cover, uh, how does that contaminated rainfall uh, end up getting back down into the ground? Well, there are pollutants that are gonna be mobilized, uh, particularly like in urban areas, road salts, petroleum hydrocarbons, heavy metals coming off, of roadways coming off of parking lots, driveways, et cetera. They eventually do make their way, even if we only have a reduction to maybe about 15% recharge, uh, those, those contaminants make their way back down into the groundwater and then seep into uh, our streams or directly into uh, our reservoir. So groundwater impacts can be both uh, from the hydrologic standpoint and hydraulic standpoint, as well as from the contamination standpoint. And, you know, you know the coastal plain areas uh, of Virginia, as well as, you know, you can look at Delaware, Maryland, even the coastal plain areas of New Jersey, uh, the types of soils in geology make these areas exceptionally susceptible to contamination uh, as a result of that infiltration of salts, petroleum hydrocarbons, heavy metals, et cetera, uh, into the groundwater. Uh, and you combine that with an increase in population density and development pressure. And you'll see in these developed areas along the coastal plain that there is, you know, incidences of uh, uh, groundwater contamination as a result of pollutants that are mobilized by stormwater, but eventually soak back down into the ground. And then eutrophication, which is a big deal, uh, has been a big part of my professional career in trying to figure out why, how, and what to do about eutrophication. Uh, it's a fancy term just for, you know, a water body becoming too green, just like you put fertilizer on your lawn and it makes your lawn greener. Uh, when you end up, you know, fertilizing uh, lakes and reservoirs, uh, you know, via uh, nitrogen and phosphorus additions, uh, primarily, again, from stormwater runoff, uh, that causes more productivity, which is expressed either as algae blooms or perhaps as macrophytes or what, you know, we uh, normally refer to as weeds. And in severe conditions, uh, although those plants are producing oxygen during the day, 
At night, they respire. They utilize oxygen. And if you end up with a die-off of that algae or a die-off of some of those weeds or there's a high amount of productivity, that can actually zap a lot of the oxygen that's in the water column and result in extreme events like a fish kill uh, on the right-hand side. So eutrophication is a big deal, uh, particularly when you know, we're talking about stormwater, watershed development, and direct measurable impacts to reservoir water quality. And as I said, you know, eutrophication is basically just a term uh, that uh, really relates to more primary production, more plants, and in this case, as I said, weeds and algae. And although it's a natural process, we do a very good job of accelerating uh, the eutrophication process through watershed development. Now, one thing I want to mention, you know, uh, you'll see a graphic that's going to come up that says that, you know, the Okaquan Reservoir is eutrophic. It doesn't mean that it's dead. It just means that it's overly productive. So don't equate eutrophication, a lot of people do, with the death and dying of, of a lake or a reservoir. It just means it's a highly productive water body. Uh, and it is subject to a lot of the problems that are associated with highly productive water bodies, namely uh, major algae blooms. So this is eutrophic lake A. I mean, you look at this, this is not too bad. I mean, I would go swimming in this lake, fishing, water skiing any day of the week. This is also eutrophic lake. Whoops, this is also a eutrophic lake. And that's not too good, okay? And the differences in the phosphorus concentrations in this lake, in this lake, believe it or not, is only 20 parts per billion. That's all the difference is between these two water bodies in terms of the average phosphorus concentration measured in those two water bodies. So it doesn't take much to put you over that tipping point where you can go from a eutrophic water body that's in pretty good shape to a eutrophic water body that's in really bad shape. Some other problems that you know, we see uh, around uh, lakes and reservoirs and something that is happening around Okaquan uh, Reservoir right now is bank clearing and shoreline development. Uh, the clearing of natural vegetation, the removal of trees, compaction of soil, and that leads to these major erosion problems uh, that transfer soil, sediment, nutrients uh, into uh, the reservoir. And you know that also leads to what I call the demise of the littoral zone. So this is a fancy term for that interface between the water and the land. But this is where a lot of the really important energy transfers, where you have fish uh, breeding habitat, uh, your aquatic insects, turtles, frogs, uh, a lot of action occurs in that littoral zone. And that gets, gets destroyed very easily as a result of bank clearing uh, in the removal of vegetation. Why does it happen? You know, some people want to have a better view. Some people want to have better access. Some people fear nature. They don't want to have that weedy, natural sort of look, you know, along the edge of their property. But in the long run, uh, this always comes back to bite lake residents and, and, and because it ends up creating bank failures uh, that in turn, uh, again, trigger a whole, like a domino effect of other aquatic impacts, particularly to the fishery. So as I said, you know, the reservoir is showing signs of impairment. Uh, this is data uh, that's been collected by a variety of sources, including DEQ, uh, you know, uh, PWCA, the, you know, the Watershed Monitoring Lab. Uh, we have sediment loading, as I, you know, showed you in that photo before, and a lot of you have probably seen this, that, that leads to turbid conditions. Our average phosphorus concentration right now is 0.036 milligrams per liter, or about 36 parts per billion. That's just about enough to stimulate an algae bloom. Anything over about 40 to 50 parts per billion is enough to stimulate and maintain an algae bloom. So you're right there at that trigger point. And that's reflected in the clarity of the reservoir. Uh, 1.4 meters, or about four and a half, five feet of clarity is not too bad. It is characteristic of a eutrophic water body, uh, but it is a water body that a lot of times is in flux and it's right on that edge of going from being pretty good to becoming bad. And that's also illustrated in this trophic state index. This is a 
uh, a quick and, and easy uh, uh, sort of like mathematical model or algorithm that limnologists use to define the trophic state or eutrophic range of water bodies. And it can be applied to a water body in California as well as a water body up in Maine. And when you get a trophic state index of 56, you're well into that eutrophic range. And that all sort of like, again, works in combination with telling me uh, that the water body is eutrophic, the reservoir is eutrophic, and that's consistent with the data that you've been seeing. And then, you know, with that comes a history of algae blooms, and then this emerging threat of harmful algae blooms, which are blooms that are caused by cyanobacteria, what we used to call blue-green algae, that create really a whole host of additional problems beyond the, the problems that are caused by a typical algae bloom. And then there is uh, documentation of, uh, of uh, at times, uh, depressed oxygen levels, less than four milligrams per liter, which starts to get stressful for even warm water fish like bass and sunnies. Uh, they prefer, you know, a DO or dissolved oxygen concentrations uh, in excess of that. So, you know, in, when you look at this in all in combination, you have a reservoir that's in pretty good shape, but it is showing signs of impairment. So it's something that you have to be aware of and something you have to be careful about going forward. As I mentioned, harmful algae blooms. Um, this is a photograph of a, an algae bloom. It wasn't cited as a cyanobacteria bloom back in 1973, uh, but you know, looking at you know, this picture, I can tell you that's probably, you know, uh, microcystis or anabena, which are two of the more common cyanobacteria. Um, and, you know, although the pictures on the right are not, you know, Okaquan Reservoir, these are the things that do happen, you know, as a result of a harmful algae bloom. Uh, you know, uh, there's, uh, you know, the, uh, the Commonwealth does have, uh, you know, standards in place that restrict uh, uh, use of water bodies once they're in the middle of a hab, you can end up with fish kills. And a big problem is, you know, impact to uh, pets and livestock as a result of harmful algae blooms. The cyanobacteria produce a toxin or a variety of toxins, and those toxins affect us. Uh, they can, you know, cause us uh, uh, health issues as well as our pets. And then in addition to that, when you have a drinking water reservoir such as, you know, such as Aquaquan, uh, you know, these algae blooms uh, can create major issues with respect to the quality of that water uh, for use for drinking. Now, luckily, the water treatment plants can do a pretty good job typically of removing those toxins. And again, the EPA has been working with the states uh, over the past five years uh, to develop HAB management plans to protect drinking water systems and protect, you know, the end users from uh, these toxins that can, uh, you know, end up uh, being generated during a HAB. But the city of Toledo back in 2014, this was an eye-opening uh, event for all reservoir managers. The whole system was shut down. They had to shut down the entire drinking water system because of water that was taken in from Lake Erie, which provides the drinking water for the city. And the toxin levels uh, exceeded uh, what was considered safe, and everybody had to go on bo on uh, bottled water. And you can't even boil the water; you have to use bottled water. So this is a you know a real problem, and we're seeing more and more of this, uh, and more of an increased awareness of uh, of HABs. But this all gets linked back to watershed development. So. You know, the problems in what we're seeing in the reservoir right now, uh, you know, it is linked back to land development. You know, for instance, Bull Run Watershed, it's only about half the land mass of Okaquan Creek Watershed, but yet the data shows that it contributes the majority of the nutrients in the sediments that directly impact the reservoir. And why is this? Again, it all gets back to stormwater runoff in wastewater, whether we're talking about septic systems or direct discharges of wastewater. And on a per unit acre basis, you're gonna end up with more pollutants that come off of urbanized land than undeveloped lands. So yeah, watershed development does lead to a lot of problems, whether it's flooding, bed and bank erosion, harmful algae blooms, sedimentation. These are all problems that have been linked over and over and over again to watershed development.
and why a watershed is a reflection of the condition of your reservoir. We know all of this, okay? You know, I, I, I did a fairly deep dive when Kim and Nikki asked me to do this presentation, looking at some of the data that's been developed over the years. And, you know, there is a fair amount of data that has been developed for the watershed and for the reservoir. And, you know, what it tells us is that, yeah, there's problems. And as, as Kim pointed out, uh, you know, that led to the down zoning of, you know, over 41,000 acres in Fairfax County. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the additional protection of another 64,500 adjacent acres. Uh, and that's a big deal because I think that has probably had a very big positive impact on the water quality of the reservoir. Um, so, you know, we know from past experience, not necessarily with Okaquan Reservoir, but other water bodies throughout the nation, that you're going to end up with more stream degradation, more reservoir uh, uh, water quality problems as our, as our watersheds are developed more and more. And this can rely, you know, really result in this tipping point being tripped. And once that tipping point is tripped, it's very, very difficult to reverse everything that has happened up to that point. And, you know, I like to say it all flows downhill. And so again, you know, I want to really kind of like, you know, beat this point uh, home that what happens in your watershed eventually affects your reservoir. Uh, and as I've shown graphically uh, and also, you know, with some, you know, with some pictures, it alters the hydrology, it alters the hydraulics, it increases that mobilization and transport of, of pollutants. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about septic systems, but those also affect, uh, they're another nutrient source. And then you add to that, you know, the runoff or the discharges that come from agricultural lands, uh, uh, industrial complexes, uh, those all really add up. Uh, and then layer on top of that, some of these extreme events, catastrophic flooding uh, that create these really acute impacts uh, to uh, the, uh, uh, the contributing uh, streams and uh, rivers, as well as uh, you know, being observed in the reservoir itself. So I like to say it's, you know, it's death by a thousand cuts. I mean, if you look at most reservoirs and lakes that are being highly managed, they didn't get there overnight to the condition where they needed to be highly managed. This is something that happened over the long term, and it was a result of a lot of small incremental damage uh, that began in the watershed. Land clearing, deforestation, soil compaction, that increase in impervious cover, septic clusters that then age and fail, and then even the runoff from these smaller storms uh, that are constantly conveying pollutants uh, into our receiving system. All of that increases those opportunities for the mobilization and transport of pollutants, sediment, and nutrients. And that all, in turn, as I said before, triggers water quality and environmental tipping points. Um, and then add to that, once again, these major events that we're seeing more and more, you know, Hurricane Ida, Hurricane Henri, you know, these these large rainfall events that create these extreme impacts uh, that do have a short-term uh, but consequential large-scale impact on our receiving systems. So, you know, again, you know, I could have thrown this graphic in a little bit sooner, but I wanted to, again, sort of like bring this home. You know, when you can see, this is sort of like a culmination of what happens when we start to develop our watersheds and what happens with respect to the hydrology. And this is data that goes back to 1987, developed by Tom Schuler, Center for Watershed Protection, um, and basically shows you whether we're talking about a large storm or a small storm, and that's the, uh, uh, the, the uh, checkered lines uh, versus, you know, the uh, base flow that's occurring in our undeveloped watershed, uh, that, that solid line. Uh, you can see as we start to develop our watersheds, what ends up happening, we're generating more runoff, the peak flow, the rate is much, much higher, 
we're getting less base flow. And it's more of a sort of like a roller coaster effect where our peaks are very high. And when those storms stop, you end up with very little base flow, as I showed you in that graphic, uh, you know, that preceding graphic. So that's a typical, you know, response to urbanization. And again, you know, you could say, well, that only happens when we end up with high amounts of impervious cover, but that's not the case. Again, this is from the Center for Watershed Protection. This is it, you know, new data. This is this is almost 20 years old. And basically it shows you that it only takes what we would consider typical suburban development, one unit per acre, to start to trigger these impacts in our, in our streams and creeks and rivers that then get uh, transferred into our reservoir. And this is another graphic, again, older data, but this data sticks. I mean, again, this is from Center for Watershed uh, uh, Protection, and it shows at 15% impervious cover, we start to lose those critical uh, uh, macroinvertebrates, the uh, aquatic insects, the uh, uh, caddisflies, mayflies, dragonflies, that are like the canary in the coal mine. When you start to see a decline in what's called these EPT species, uh, that starts to tell you that there is significant degradation of that stream. And when you start to see stream degradation, that ends up being transferred into lake and reservoir degradation. So this is occurring only at about 15% uh, impervious cover. Go back to this slide here, that's about equivalent to one house per acre. We see the same thing when we start to look at that channelization or the incising of that stream channel, that, that, that graphic that I showed you previously. The streams start to widen uh, and widen significantly uh, once, once we reach about 25% impervious cover. Still, this is in that suburban type of development range. This is not, we're not talking about large commercial tracks or malls or what, what have you. This is typical suburban level of development. So all in all, this gets back to, you know, why we're here this evening. Let's talk about, you know, reservoir eutrophication. And, you know, the bottom line is that it is accelerated by watershed development, particularly with respect. I mean, the immediate impacts you see uh, is, is in respect to, you know, this added nutrient loading, uh, and it doesn't take much. So if you look at the typical concentration of phosphorus in stormwater, it's about 0 0.28 milligrams per liter, or about 280 parts per billion, okay? As I mentioned before, you only need 30 to 50 parts per billion to cause an algae bloom or to start to stimulate a harmful algae bloom. Now, the knee-jerk reaction in a lot of lake communities, and this has not been the case for the Okaquan Reservoir, is once you see a, you know, an algae bloom is to go out and treat it with copper sulfate. But that is not a solution. It's really, uh, it's a short-term, it may, you may end up with some short-term benefits, but, but it's been shown time and time again, uh, you know, this uh, uh, repeated copper sulfate treatments, these algicide applications over time actually create conditions that favor more algae blooms and more harmful algae blooms. That's a whole nother, you know, evening discussion, but I can tell you the data is out there to substantiate that. But, you know, the reservoir isn't subject to, you know, copper treatments. It hasn't had a copper treatment for over 10 years, and that's a good thing. So that phosphorus connection, and this is what I'm going to really try to focus on for the balance here, because this is directly affected by uh, land development. Phosphorus is the key nutrient. The more phosphorus is food, you know, the, the more productivity. The greener your lawn is when you add more nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, same thing holds true with lakes and reservoirs. However, phosphorus is limiting nutrient, meaning that the more phosphorus you add, the more algae, the more cyanobacteria, the more problems you end up uh, with uh, in terms of degradation of that water quality. And it's all connected back to the amount of phosphorus. So phosphorus, this food that is fundamental for algae and harmful algae bloom development, uh, it varies in magnitude, it varies in source. Uh, some of it can be internally generated, but the majority of it in, in most situations is external. 
And most of that is coming from stormwater runoff, followed by septic systems, followed by point sources. And these would be like direct discharges from industry or wastewater systems. But typically in suburban uh, you know, uh, uh, type of settings, it's gonna be stormwater runoff and septic systems that are the leading source of phosphorus loading. So it's important, you know, when you have a water body that is either close to that uh, tipping point or has exceeded that tipping point, to start to dial back how much phosphorus is allowed to enter that water body. And I call it putting, you know, our lake or reservoir on a phosphorus diet. And that is the proven way to slow down eutrophication and avoid algae blooms, including harmful algae blooms. Uh, this comes down to a number of things that again, fall back to how we manage our watersheds. And if we're gonna do that, we need to know our watershed. Uh, you already have the benefit of having agencies that have been working on this watershed for a long period of time. So a lot of that information is already out there, but it's important that we know the watershed boundary. Think of your watershed as a funnel. And every drop of rainfall that falls within that funnel eventually makes it to the Okaquan Reservoir. It may take more time from one point versus another point, but all of that rainfall eventually makes it down to the reservoir. And some of that's a function of topography, how quick, you know, the steepness, that'll define how quickly that, that, that rainfall enters in a receiving stream and then is transferred down gradient land cover, uh, the vegetative cover, the land use, how much development, the hydrology, as I have emphasized before, and the type of pollutant sources and pollutant loads uh, that are associated with those various land covers and land uses. All of that needs to be quantified, and this is something that you could start doing, and this is something that I feel is important. We start looking at what could happen under different development scenarios within your watershed. Uh, it's very easy to model the amount of phosphorus, nitrogen, and sediment loading that's coming in on an annual scale. However, to get even better information, you should look at that on a sub-watershed scale uh, and even break that down further to sub-sub-watersheds. I also like to look at it by what type of pollutants are coming in and how much of a particular pollutant that's associated with a given type of land use or a particular type of source. That could be septics, for instance. And then I further break that down looking at seasonal changes because you know the amount of phosphorus that enters a reservoir during the winter may not have as much of an impact as the same amount of phosphorus entering in the spring or during the middle of the summer, simply because there's more productivity, there's more algae growth, there's more biological activity when the water is warmer. And then we also have to look at manageable versus non-manageable loads. And this is really important because for instance, I could have a totally forested watershed that is very large and that is still generating phosphorus and nitrogen. I'm not gonna go down and cut down a bunch of trees and build a basin to try to manage that load. That's my background load. That's my natural load to this system. So that's a non-manageable component of my load. However, if I have loading that's coming in from developed areas, those are very manageable. Those are areas where I have to focus my attention to, either existing areas of development or proposed areas of development. So a lot of this you already know. Again, as I said, you have had the benefit of having a number of agencies working uh, you know, with you and for this reservoir and you know, for the protection of the, uh, of the uh, water quality of the, not only the reservoir, but if, uh, of its tributaries. Uh, but what I've seen is that a lot of this data does need to be updated with focus really placed on particular areas at risk. And in, you know, in, 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 in this case, we do have given portions of the watershed that are under more development pressure than other, develop, you know, other sections of the watershed. And that is the rural crossing. So you know, this is something that you know better than I but uh, there has been a lot of, of discussion about developing uh, this section of the watershed that was set aside uh, in you know, a, a lot of that land preserved uh, or downzoned 
uh, to protect the quality of the reservoir as well as the quality of the streams that feed the reservoir. But there's a big development threat. And to really assess the degree of what can happen to your reservoir, uh, you need to be looking at this, you know, in my opinion, in a very objective, quantitative manner and evaluating uh, the impacts that will occur to the reservoir. And I can guarantee you they will occur, you know, as land is converted from forested land to more urbanized land. We saw examples of that, you know, in the earlier parts of the, uh, you know, this presentation. So what should we do? Well, it, you know, what's been shown time and time again is that preventative actions are better than reactive actions. And what I mean by that is that when you have the opportunity to protect, pr protect preserve, and conserve undeveloped lands, do that, okay? Uh, Kim and I have talked about some of the actions that were taken by New York City to actually purchase lands uh, within their watershed. Uh, and they have a very large watershed that extends well up into a couple of counties pretty far away from New York City to buy up that land, to preserve that land. Then it has had benefit in terms of decreasing some of the immediate impacts. But you know, when you can protect, preserve, and conserve undeveloped lands, then what you're doing is your soils stay uncompacted. You have good native vegetation, plenty of tree cover. That all reduces the volume of runoff. That all puts that a lot of that precipitation, 55% of that precipitation back down into the ground. And what you'll see is that you have very stable stream corridors, less pollutant mobilization, less pollutant loading. Trees are a really big, important element of stormwater management. And not only in terms of planting trees in areas where they've been removed, but in preserving trees where they're growing right now. You know, a typical tree can take up about 500 to 800 gallons per day. That's a lot of potential runoff. And as we saw before, when you look at, you know, how much uh, precipitation is lost via evapotranspiration as a result of precipitation, how much water is put back into the ground as, you know, in these undeveloped areas, it's a significant difference between uh, you know, what occurs in, you know, with respect to the volume of runoff. We also have the opportunity, I'm a big believer in restoring and expanding stream corridors in riparian areas. That is a big part of the work that's being done here in New Jersey and the New Jersey Highlands, again, trying to acquire land and then restore floodplains, uh, and provide the opportunity again for streams to naturally uh, interact with the adjacent land instead of having pavement there. When you have trees, native vegetation, uncompacted soils, there's the ability to mitigate a lot of flood flows, attenuate sediments, and bio-uptake or bio-utilize uh, 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 nutrients in a variety of different types of pollutants. What do we do about areas that are already developed, you know, addressing past sins? For developed lands, you know, the primary thing that you need to do uh, is better stormwater management and the use of green infrastructure. And a lot of you are very familiar with that. Uh, Virginia is, uh, is long, along with Maryland because of the Chesapeake Bay initiatives. They've been a leader. Uh, this, you know, uh, Virginia has been a leader in stormwater management. There's a lot of great examples that I use quite frequently, uh, you know, to illustrate things that are being done he, you know, in Virginia versus things that are being done uh, in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey. Um, septic management is another big deal. Uh, and I, like I said, I've dealt with a lot of lake communities and a lot of reservoirs that are in uh, semi-rural areas that have septic systems as the primary means of dealing with uh, wastewater. And uh, septic systems over time uh, can definitely be a source of uh, pollutant loading, uh, particularly nitrogen, but also phosphorus, uh, but that can be managed. Uh, there's ways of improving uh, the septic, uh, septic system's ability to uh, attenuate nutrients, uh, and there's ways of, of maximizing the lifespan of septic systems. Now, a lot of people say, well, if I have, you know, an area that's got a lot of septics, why don't I just put it on sewer? 
And that may you know, take care of part of the problem, but with that comes a large increase in development pressure. I mean, it costs a lot of money to sewer. It even costs a lot of money to do some of these clustered type of uh, small scale uh, sewerage systems. Uh, and with that, because of the cost, uh, you end up with a lot of development pressure. Uh, and at the end of the day, there's still, you're still generating large quantities of phosphorus. And you know, over time, that's gonna make its way down into the groundwater and then eventually into uh, you know, our streams that then feed uh, the reservoir. Or if you've got a point discharge now, it's being released into a stream directly after some degree of treatment. But in any event, uh, how do we, you know, we address those past sins through better stormwater management and better septic management? So stormwater management, you know, in developed and developing areas, um, this is something that, you know, in my professional career, I got more and more involved in because it was a direct positive benefit to the community, the lake communities and, and the, uh, the drinking water systems that I was working with. If we could do better stormwater management, we were decreasing the amount of pollutant loading to those systems. So getting away from like these standard detention basins that might do a pretty good job in terms of attenuating peak flows and controlling flooding, but using more of these decentralized, smaller footprint green infrastructure systems that you see throughout the mid-Atlantic states, particularly in Virginia and Maryland, uh, that do a great job at reducing runoff volume, promoting groundwater recharge, and bioassimilating bio a lot of nutrients as well as uh, you know, uh, uh, capturing and uh, a lot of other types of like road runoff pollutants and, and you know, uh, pollutants of that nature. So with green infrastructure, you know, what we're talking about is in, at the end of the day is really turning down the volume, decreasing the amount of runoff. And again, we're, what we're trying to do is use these stormwater management practices that actually emulate what happens in an undeveloped watershed. Uh, you have soils that are working with plants to collect and hold runoff, put it, some of that back down into the ground, lose some of it by evaporation or, ev or evapotranspiration. And as a result, the plants and soils by working together uh, improve the quality of the runoff that is eventually discharged from the site and the big deal is that actually decreases significantly the volume of runoff that's being discharged from the site. And you can see the value of green infrastructure, not only like in suburban neighborhoods, you know, why is, you know, D, why is Washington DC, Philadelphia, uh, you know, you can go up and down and look, you know, New York City, Milwaukee, Seattle, Portland, they've all embraced green infrastructure. Why? Because there are other mandates by EPA to decrease the amount of stormwater that is being discharged because of combined sewer overflow, but they have found ways in all of those examples to actually implement green infrastructure, even in highly urbanized uh, types of, of areas, uh, you know, going back and retrofitting existing stormwater systems. So there's, there are ways to, you know, to, to pay for a past sins. And so, as I said before, green infrastructure, is just a, you know, highly scalable sort of natural way of managing stormwater runoff. And it could be something as simple as a basin or swale, or it can be a landscape feature as you know, I'll show you as, in some of these slides. But you know, the cell, they function in, in concert uh, to remove pollutants, put water back down into the ground and you know, reduce the volume of stormwater runoff. Added benefits in some cases, you, know, you can have some additional aesthetics and create habitat. Rain gardens, I'm a big believer in rain gardens. Uh, they do a great job. Some of the earliest examples, uh, you know, were in Prince George's County, Maryland, and they're very scalable. And basically, again, you're, what you're, you're mimicking what's happening in, in an undeveloped uh, uh, setting. You can put these in, this is along, uh, a, you know, a roadway in a, uh, a retirement community in, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Uh, where that water just used to collect on the side of the road, go into a storm sewer and then be discharged into a stream. Created a nice little vegetated buffer area that also uh, can function to remove pollutants and reduce volume. You can see these are, again, these are examples in a more urbanized setting. 
Uh, and so you can start to integrate uh, these green swales in, in bioretention uh, uh, systems, even in highly uh, used roadways. Uh, this is an example of, you know, by a lake in central New Jersey where the parking lot median uh, were converted from being convex to concave, planted, and then utilized as an on-site stormwater management system without any loss of parking uh, and without any, you know, decrease uh, in the functionality of that parking lot. And then, as I said before, these are things that are being done in, in highly urbanized areas. These are examples from Philadelphia. Uh, this is a, a meadow that was constructed in a park that's not too far away from my house. Um, and this basically collects a tremendous amount of runoff uh, from the adjoining uh, parkland and walking paths, biking paths, and manages that in a, you know in a setting that when you would look at this, you wouldn't think that this is a stormwater management feature. And then you can have some of these regional. This is a regional stormwater management feature, a green infrastructure feature that's actually managing about 180 acres of contributing watershed. That's about 55 percent impervious cover. Um, so you now when you look at this. You know, somebody wouldn't really think that this is a stormwater management system, but it is. As I mentioned, septic systems, that's another source of phosphorus and nutrient loading, you know, in our developing and developed watersheds, uh, you know, and uh, nationwide, about 20% of the homes in the U.S., you know, rely on septic systems. Uh, the majority of that work by that septic system, though, occurs within the leach field. And this is where we see a lot of problems. Uh, nitrogen in the first, you know, first place is not readily removed by soil. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you can end up with nitrate contamination uh, with, you know, when you have systems that are either too densely, uh, you know, or too dense, or systems that are not being properly uh, managed and maintained. Uh, in phosphorus, although it is readily absorbed by soil, the older that leach field gets, the more compromised it gets. Perhaps it's getting overloaded. You know, the house is built originally, as I see a lot of times with lake communities, as a, a summer, you know, uh, bungalow, and then it's converted to a full-time, you know, home. Uh, those leach fields get compromised, you know, hydraulically, and as a result of that, uh, the phosphorus removal capability goes way down. And then septic systems don't do a pretty, don't do a good job in removing other contaminants like pharmaceuticals, some of these, uh, you know, these uh, forever uh, contaminants, uh, PFAS and PFAS, uh, these uh, you know, uh, uh, chemicals that were put in as fire retardant uh, chemicals in, you know, in clothing, uh, all that stuff passes very easily through leach fields. It's not absorbed very well by soils. The septic load, you know, you might say, okay, you know, you know, we're dealing with, you know, sort of like a suburban community. Well, a typical home, you know, three, three point five individuals per dwelling. I don't know who the half a person is, but three and a half individuals per dwelling, okay, generates about a pound of phosphorus per year, most of which is bioavailable. It's like a phosphate, so it means it's readily available for uptake by uh, algae. It doesn't sound like a lot. But one pound of phosphorus is enough to support about a thousand pounds of algae. So start thinking of that. And this is where you know, septic systems can have a big impact on the water quality of a reservoir or a lake. So we're about at the end of the hour. You know, in summary, you know, what happens in the Okaquan watershed is definitely a major driver and has been a major driver of the reservoir's water quality. Uh, it's going to affect its rate of eutrophication. It affects, you know, turbidity events, you know, as you see in terms of that muddiness of the water at times. And when we get to some of these severe eutrophication-related problems, that can include halves. You're not there yet, but you don't want to ever get there. You know, in general, you know, these water quality problems that I've seen you know, in, in the 300-plus lakes and reservoirs that I've worked on, I would say... 99% of the times, it's traced right back to what's happened within the watershed uh, as a result of more runoff, that added hydraulic load and hydrologic load, more storm flows that cause that downcutting and erosion of the, the contributing streams and creeks, more pollutant loading, more nutrient loading, 
all of that ends up creating problems uh, in that receiving system. You know, all forms of land development increase runoff, you know, whether you're talking about agricultural, suburban development, you know, high end, uh, you know, uh, high intensity uh, development, data centers, uh, malls, et cetera. Uh, all of that increases uh, water quality problems. Uh, there are some ways, as I showed you, to help mitigate some of that. Uh, and fortunately, you know, there's a growing uh, interest in applying uh, either by regulation or by retrofitting, uh, you know, areas with green infrastructure, but it's still a source. And even at best, although I'm a big advocate of green infrastructure, if you look at the nitrogen and phosphorus removal capabilities of green infrastructure, even the best design systems, you're talking about at best maybe a, around 80% phosphorus removal and maybe about 60% nitrogen removal. There are some exceptions within get up, get up higher, but still you're talking about anywhere from 30 to maybe 40 to 50% more nutrient loading that you had prior to development, even with the best stormwater management practices in place. And then any septic system that's within 300 feet of a waterway, again, this is data that's been developed over the years by EPA, uh, is a potential source of both phosphorus and nitrogen loading with the amount of loading increasing as that, as that septic system or cluster of septic systems start to age or they fail to be properly maintained, which is a typical consequence with a lot of septic systems. So it only makes sense, you know, you've got data that goes back to the 1980s, clearly showing a direct correlation between watershed development and water quality degradation. So, you know, when I look at this, just as I, I do when I've looked at many, uh, you know, other lakes and reservoirs where I have a chance, my recommendation is always preserve, conserve, and protect all your undeveloped lands, especially forested lands because of their ability to attenuate a lot of stormwater precipitation. For developed areas, you know, where you have past sins, uh, you know, go back and try to retrofit as much as possible. And for developing areas, make sure that, you know, proper construction practices are being implemented, low impact development pra practices, avoid soil compaction, use green infrastructure as a way of managing a post-development stormwater runoff. And for areas that are on septic right now, uh, septic management and the use of advanced on-site wastewater management techniques, again, this is a whole nother evening of, of discussion, but that can have a positive benefit on decreasing some of that septic load. But unfortunately, a lot of times you don't see mandates for septic management uh, and you don't see proper septic management being implemented or the uh, uh, you know, requirement for some of these advanced on-site uh, uh, septic systems uh, that do a better job at removing nitrogen and phosphorus. So with that, I think I've taken up about an hour. Um, we've got plenty of time for questions. Kim, I'll stay on as long as people want me to stay on. Um, and thank you for your patience and, and for your uh, uh, you know, uh, interest in, in this subject. Thanks for a great presentation. And now we will see what people would like to discuss or have more information on. So Adele. Okay, hi, uh, this is Adele Godridge. I should uh, say that uh, I should identify myself as somebody who works at the Aquaquan Watershed Monitoring Lab. So you should use some of our data. Um, <clears throat> I had an observation and a question. The observation was uh, we found over the years uh, many cases of rain gardens and bioretention ponds and uh, constructed wetlands that seem to be looking really nice and looking good on the face of it. But these are uh, some of the some of, some of them were designed for infiltration, obviously. But you notice you find out later that uh, many of them are lined with compacted clay at the bottom, and that sort of defeats the purpose. I don't know how much of that you've noticed in. Uh, in, the in the kind of work that you've done. Uh, the question I had was, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I fully agree with the, we have met the enemy and it's, it is us, but, uh, and, and part of that relates to what level of uh, development and population you put on a watershed. 
But beyond population, you could have the same population and, and uh, you have a prosperous uh, community or areas like Fairfax County is very prosperous in terms of the nation. Um, and many smaller, uh, I mean, many lots, so say even a quarter, quarter acre size lot with a small house uh, might get converted to a McMansion with a small, you know, same lot. And what impact, have you found credible studies that show the hydrologic impact of these McMansions beyond just a simple modeling exercise of, okay, I got more impervious area uh, of the roof and, and all that, um, that indicate what kind of impact do those things have? Because that is more of an infill thing where your population overall may not change a lot, um, you know, on a per home development uh, unit, but the home size has increased tremendously in comparison to the land area. Right. So, I, you know, two, two really good questions that are related. And first off, you know, I, I did take advantage of a lot of the data that has been collected uh, you know, by you and, you know, uh, and, and, you know, it's great stuff. And I think it's, it's important to have that database in place because it's, it's definitely the barometer that's needed to track, uh, you know, the condition of, of the reservoir uh, going forward, as well as having the ability to look at how things uh, have evolved, has evolved over time. So to answer your first question, um, yeah, I mean, if you look at like the Virginia BMP manual, there's specific guidelines and specifications for the construction of various green infrastructures, uh, you know, including rain gardens. And the common, if you know, if you look at BMP manuals that have been de developed nationwide, you know, when you when they talk about uh, rain gardens and these smaller green infrastructure systems, the first thing is using a soil with high porosity, typically high sand content high organic content, very low uh, silt and clay content. And that's supposed to be a standard specification for rain garden construction. Um, so if you have situations where they've been constructed either using some type of native soil that has a high silt and clay content or the native soil underneath that system uh, were compacted, uh, it, that sort of defeats the purpose of having those types of systems. So the first thing I would do is make sure that they're being constructed in a manner that's consistent with the specifications that are in the BMP manual. And the Virginia BMP manual uh, is, you know, again, one of the BMP manuals that I, I often turn to and use as an example of how to construct things correctly. So if those types of things have been happening, that's an unfortunate, you know, it's unfortunate but you know the specifications that are clearly laid out, um, you know, you shouldn't be having those types of, of uh, you know rain gardens constructed. I Second question. Uh, I suspect that uh, part of the problem is, I believe, that uh, where the where the inspection of these things takes place, when it takes place, uh, it usually it's left up to the uh, constructor or the developer or whatever to construct these, and then the final inspection takes place once they are done. Uh, and that nobody's really looking to see what have they done underneath that all. Right. And, and no, and that, we yeah, found, and that, they've been accidentally found. I mean, we've said something is wrong with the hydrology. Uh, let's do a core. And you find a, do a core and you find out, whoops, there's a thick layer of compacted clay. And you go to the developer and say, oh, yeah, we always do put compacted clay underneath all these things. So uh, it's somehow the message is not getting through or maybe the inspection needs to be at a certain point and say, okay, show me that you've done it the right way. Right, right, and that's absolutely true. And, and you know, and although, you know, I showed you some examples of rain gardens like dating back to the 1990s, you know, it's still, you know, unfortunately, you know, it, I, and I, I don't like to slam, you know, a lot of civil engineers, but, you know, they've been trained primarily with respect to detention. And when you're dealing with detention, you can have a compacted bottom on your basin, that's fine, that's what you want. Uh, this is a different way of approaching stormwater management. And, you know, uh, and I think that, that those cases, hopefully they become far and few or, or, you know, less frequent. Maybe some of that also involves, you know, better training of the building inspectors, et cetera. But, um, you know, I, I do have some lake communities that uh, require rain gardens as part of new development 
or, or if there's like, a, like you're saying, like a, a tear down and a buildup of a new home. And uh, in those cases, the, there is a requirement uh, that the soil that is brought in to build that, to construct that rain garden, or if it's a, like a, uh, a vegetated swale, that it actually, they actually have a manifest for it. They can show like what was brought in uh, and demonstrate that it has, you know, basically 90% sand content and around 10 to 15% organic content. So, I mean, and, you know, it, it may sound like it's, it's a crazy specification, but typically that specification is the same as what you would see for a septic field. So it's not that different than, you know, the soils that are used to construct a, you know, septic field. Um, the second part of your question, um, I, I have seen this and I've had, I have both firsthand experience with this as well as have modeled this in lake communities where, you know, uh, they started off as bungalow communities and then got converted to full-time homes and then gone through process of being sold and then the tear down and the build up and they're on like an eighth of an acre lot or even smaller in some cases. And now you've got, you know, a home that is three or four, you know, bedrooms and much, much larger than what was there before. So it was an added, in, you know, increase in impervious cover. And in a lot of those situations are run, you know, these, these communities are sewered. So it's not like the septic system is limiting the amount of development. And, you know, if you look at the amount of impervious cover that's allowed, uh, you know, and this gets back to planning sometimes, you know, what might be allowed is like 25 to 30% impervious cover. And that's a lot for a lake, you know, a lakefront lot. So, uh, you know, I feel for you in that respect, but, uh, you know, you can send me an email at another point in time, and I can delve into that in greater detail in terms of some actual studies, as well as some of the, you know, the work that I've done uh, that, you know, can show uh, some of the, you know, those types of situations that, that have arisen, particularly in, you know, lake communities. Thank you. Kim, I'll leave it to you to announce who next to ask okay, a question. Okay, you bet. And thanks, Adele, for those really great questions. And I will give you Dr. Souza's contact info. Matt, welcome. Thank you, and thank you for this presentation. Um, my question is just kind of general from for the layman's. Well, this is not necessarily layman's, but I'm not an expert on it. But you know, in Virginia, we're using this Virginia runoff reduction methodology, and we've inserted all of these nutrient banks and different types of kind of we're we're off. You know, they're quantifying their uh, their loads of nutrients and then offsetting them by one providing you know, runoff mitigation and dealing with their surface water. And then next, purchasing credit. So I'm just curious in general, what does the data tell us? Is, is that working? Um, and just, you know, in general, is that working? And what are we finding using that methodology with kind of the insertion of nutrient banks and those types of things? Thank you. Right. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I was involved with some of that more in Maryland. Uh, I haven't done a, I, you know, while I was, you know, president of Princeton Hydro, we were doing projects of that nature, uh, primarily in Maryland. But um, yeah, the, those nut nutrient offset credits, um, there's not a lot of data yet that's out there to show how it works. I mean, again, you can quantify that. And from the standpoint of modeling it, you can show that there's, you know, benefit in, and, and, and as you know, I mean, the majority of this, of what's being done is really, you know, for the benefit of, uh, of you know, of Chesapeake Bay. But uh, I, I have to admit, there's not a lot of um, long-term studies that have actually looked at these things after they've been constructed, how they've functioned over time, and what their actual pollutant removal uh, capabilities uh, are, and whether or not the offset really worked as, you know, as uh, uh, proposed or as, as uh, anticipated, but, you know, you can model it and that's, you know, and that's what's typically done uh, to evaluate, you know, like one, like say like, uh, you know, a, a half a mile of stream corridor uh, uh, restoration. What is that equivalent to in terms of reducing the pollutant load 
from a one acre parking lot? You know, how does that, how does that equilibrate uh, or equalize? There's just not a lot of data out there, real world data to show how that's working, unfortunately. I mean, I like the concept. I think it's, a, you know, it's, it's an interesting approach, um, but exactly how it's working, uh, myself personally, I have not seen a lot of data, you know, real data uh, other than model data uh, to say how it's working. Thanks. And I, we have two hands up, Elena and Jack, and we have a series of questions in the chat. So we're going to try to move things right along here so we can get to everything. Elena and then Jack, and then I'll go to the questions in the chat. Fantastic presentation, really. So um, I just um, noted, uh, made a couple notes to myself because I feel like there are these competing pollutants um, and uh, you have impervious services um, and then you have, you discussed septic. So here is my concern and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to tell me what you think is the bigger threat. Um, we know in Prince William County, um, there are supervisors that are interested in a real sea change, and they see the rural crescent as undeveloped land that needs to be developed. And so we know that there are applications for industrial development, high density housing, and they talk about smart growth in the rural crescent with affordable housing. And of course, that brings the associated infrastructure of roads, of malls, of shopping centers, you can see the Rural Crescent falling pretty quickly. So my concern is um, that I see developers using septic um, and sewer as the only competing interest, such that they will recommend, well, in order to save the watershed, you're gonna have to sewer everything. So I appreciated that you acknowledge that sewer is a tool used for development. So my, my question is, when I think about the bigger threats to the watershed, uh, I see development and all the impervious surfaces and all the infrastructure that will be needed to support that as a bigger threat because I see your recommendation for dealing with some of those issues with septic as manageable. So can you speak to, um, I don't know if it, you've read some of the threats with the industrial development of data centers and possibly ask just really the sea change occurring in the rural crescent, what you see is a bigger threat. Can we manage the issues with septic and, and protect the rural crescent and, um, and the, the idea that you know, Fairfax County down zoned and then protected by their Occoquan um, um, uh, riverbank, and we instead said, well, we would down plan development for the Rural Crescent. So my concern is, um, I, does that make sense what I've, you know, it's like they're, this idea that, that you're going to develop the Rural Crescent, you're going to save, you're going to save the Rural Crescent by developing it, and thus save the Occoquan Reservoir by developing the Rural Crescent. And those are inconsistent goals to me. And I'll, I'll just leave that with you and you can share what I... Yeah, I mean, and that's why, you know, if I, you know, in a situation where I, if I was given the opportunity to, you know, preserve and protect an existing undeveloped watershed, that would be my first, you know, course of action. Because, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. I mean, and you can, you can implement the best stormwater management practices possible. As I said before, I mean, when we're looking at nutrients, you know, the best we can do is maybe about 70, 50% for, for nitrogen. There, there are some systems that get up to about 90% for nitrogen, but, you know, typically it's about 50% for nitrogen, 70 to 80% maybe for phosphorus, 90% for, for sediment. Um, but, that's percentages. So when you start looking at, okay, now I'm going to increase that sediment load from, uh, you know, it could be like 100,000 pounds a year that come off of a forested, you know, area to now a million pounds a year. Uh, and, you know, you're, you're, even if you're reducing some of that, uh, there's still that additional 100,000, you know, pounds 
that, that's washing into our reservoir. I've just doubled what I had before, even with the best stormwater management. So you have to think about that from that perspective. So that's why I always say, if I've got the opportunity to preserve and protect, that's going to be where I'm going to go. And why, you know, and why is there so much emphasis always placed on, you know, on, on, you know, like blue fields and green fields and buying back, uh, you know, areas that are in flood prone areas or areas that are, you know, uh, a land to preserve. I mean, that, that's that been a big thing in New Jersey with the pylons and the highlands, uh, trying to purchase and preserve as much of that undeveloped land as possible, because once it's gone, it's gone. So that's number one. Number two, I think, you know, uh, uh, sewering may be part of a solution when you just look at it from this perspective of, okay, we're going to take some of this septic load and now we're going to remove it from the system, but still it's got to go to a treatment plant and that treatment plant's got to discharge to somewhere into something. And that's typically going to be to a stream and that could be to a stream that discharges back into the, into the reservoir. Um, let's say it's going into some a communal field. Uh, it, you, basically now you just have one big septic field that is subject to you know some of the same pressures that you have when you have individual septic fields. So it's difficult for me to say exactly what's going to happen. This is why I was saying it's important to go in and actually quantify what's happening on a site-specific basis, where you are now and where you could be, you know, at different levels of development. But, you know, when it comes to sewering, you know, as you pointed out, Alana, you know, the, the, the primary thing that ends up happening is that there's a, a, there has to be a large increase in the amount of associated uh, infrastructure. Uh, there's gonna, you know, you have to tear up the side of the road to put the sewer lines in. You're gonna end up now with a sewage treatment plant that costs a lot of money and to, you know, to make that viable, that means more development, more homes, more roads, more schools, you know, more supporting uh, infrastructure. So, uh, you know, I, I don't see soaring, particularly when you're going from a rural type of setting uh, as a solution. I, I, don't, I don't see that as a solution. Uh, I see it as, a, as a, a gateway to actually more problems, but it can be, the only thing you can do is actually, somebody has got to sit down and take the time and quantify what those impacts are and how best they could be mitigated. And then once you look at how well they can be mitigated, what does that still mean in terms of water quality impacts to not only the reservoir, but the, uh, you know, the, the streams and, and creeks that feed it? Thank you very much. And Jack, but let's be quick, Jack. <laughs> Oops, sir. Okay, I unmuted myself. And I, I have told the story about the vision for the Occoquan that uh, you know Norm Cole and Norman Cole and others brought to the table, so that we all got together in 1972 and formed uh, formed uh, the uh, Upper Occoquan uh, Sewer Authority, now called the Service Authority, and 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 we do treat uh, that the uh, sewage to such an extent that uh, as it enters the headwaters of the Occoquan Reservoir is much, much cleaner than what we had prior to 1972. And so what, and other things we did in the Chess Bay uh, Preservation Act uh, broadly was to have the 100% reserve capacity for septic systems. Uh, so any lot platted after 1970 uh, has to have that 100% reserve capacity. And I think we still need to take kind of a mass balance and quantify our parameters and look at what we're doing because we have lost uh, due to sediment over a billion gallons of storage in the reservoir. So things that we need to do <laughs> to think smartly, we need to have uh, BMPs for stormwater management, especially uh, on uh, uh, near the shoreline for the, uh, for the Occoquan. And, and such a simple thing, such as putting in swales, for, for um, stormwater infiltration and catchment for sediment runoff, uh, it can make a big difference. You know, just the way we look at a site, uh, I know we need to look at maybe low salt alternatives for applications in the roadways. Uh, we've got rain gardens, we've got the vegetative swales. We've got a, a lot of different things we can do to 
mitigate the stormwater aspects. And we know anything closer than 300 feet from a waterway on septic systems, we need to really take a careful eye at those. Do you have uh, a question? Yeah. No, and I, I was just saying, I, I was so glad to see the engagement and I enjoyed the talk. And I say that there are a lot of things we need to focus in on. I know when, when I was on the committee that worked on the uh, overlay report, we, we had recommendations to protect the aquaquan and hopefully we can get some specific things out of that later. And hopefully this presentation yeah. will help with that process. Yeah. The okay. first question well, we you. have, thank you, Jack, is from Carter Wiley. Do you want to ask your own question or I can read it? Pop up if you're going to ask yourself. I don't see anybody. Sorry. I can't. I just got oh, off. There you are. What? I just what? wanted to know what his what his view was on the new stormwater management practices that are required for Chesapeake Bay water quality. How this affects or offsets uh, impacts of development. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, you know the um, those stormwater management practices, as I said, Virginia has been one of the leading you know uh, you know leading states in the nation uh, in, in terms of you know, advanced, what I would call advanced stormwater management, getting away just from, from detention and looking at ways to actually decrease volume and decrease, uh, you know, pollutants associated with that runoff. Uh, the, the thing is, and I think, you know, uh, it was brought up before by Adele that, uh, you know, you can have the best design, but if it's not being constructed properly or maintained correctly, then it doesn't make a difference. But I think the stormwater management practices in the BMP, what's in the BMP manual and what's being required by regulation is good. I mean, it, it's, it's designed to help decrease, you know, these, these impacts, whether we're talking about volume impacts or, you know, we're talking about pollutant impacts or even peak flow, you know, the hydraulic impacts that, that, that the, uh, uh, the erosion and scour. Uh, but it, at the end of the day, uh, it really comes down to how the how it's being implemented, if it's being implemented correctly, and if it's if those systems are then being maintained properly over time. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I would say in in a lot of ways, you know, I, I I'm very positive about that. Um, because it can help mitigate a lot of the potential problems. It doesn't do away with all of the problems, but it can help mitigate a lot of the problems and it can help pay for past sins as well. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question directly, but uh, you know, I, I, I don't have any fault with uh, you know, the, uh, the best management practices that are required for either new development or what's being implemented in some situations for retrofit of past development. Um, and so I'm not sure, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. I just, I was curious because in most new developments now, all stormwater management has to be treated before it can leave a site. So how do you measure the true impact of development if it's addressed in its BMP? Right, so this is, it, this gets back again, you can do monitoring, you can actually go and, and on a on a like a, a basin specific basis, you know, do stormwater sampling and see how well that system is actually performing, and then you know quantify that and extrapolate it for that community. Or if it's like a, you know a regional basin, you know, see how how much attenuation is really occurring, both in terms of volume, rate, and pollutant removal. So you can you can you can quantify that. Storm sampling is not an easy thing to do, but it can be done. And then again, there are models that can be run to evaluate that. And then you can set up long-term databases to also look at the quality, changes in quality of your receiving system. Are you seeing you know, a, a, a decrease in uh, you know, the pollutant load? Are you seeing an impact to the aquatic insects? There's a variety of ways that, that you could monitor that, but it does take, you know, it does take some type of, of sampling, either direct sampling, or some type of model. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. And so, and we all know we have eight questions in the chat. 
which is quite a few. So I, I see the question from I have the chat open. So I see the question from Maryland about uh -huh. uh, climate change. And um, just interesting because on Wednesday I'm doing another presentation for the uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania chapter of the American Water Resources Association dealing with climate change related impacts to uh, lake and reservoir systems. And uh, those are, those are, it's scary stuff because we're seeing, you know, bigger storm events that create those, those extreme events that create those acute problems, uh, in, both in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, impact the streams and, and stream corridors, but also in terms of mobilizing uh, tremendous amounts of pollutants, uh, you know, flooding uh, industrial sites that ends up getting into reservoirs, et cetera. Um, so climate change is a big deal. And um, I think with even with the smaller storms, if you go back and you look at, you know, USGS uh, storm frequency data, what we refer to now is the one-year event, which has, you know, you know basically it has a 100% chance of occurring in any one year, but it equates to maybe about 2.7 to maybe three inches of rainfall in 24 hours. You know, you go back and look 25, 30 years ago, that was almost about the two-year event. So these, even these smaller storms are generating more rainfall, which means more potential damage, both physical damage as well as pollutant related damage. So climate change is something that uh, is being looked at and uh, there's attempts to address this uh, in how stormwater is being managed. The reservoir, the, you know, I, I deal with the largest water supply reservoir in the state of New Jersey. And uh, there's, you know, we've developed a risk management plan. I've worked on this risk management plan that is specifically deals with extreme events, you know, that are triggered by triggered by climate change. What areas within the watershed will get flooded? You know, how many of those are industrial sites that have the potential to convey, you know, very nasty pollutants down into the reservoir? Septic clusters that could be, you know, overwhelmed by a flood event. Uh, things along those lines. So. Uh, you know, in terms of climate change, yeah, there's going to be more storms, more flooding, and uh, that definitely has a direct impact on the quality of drinking water. But I can I can tell you, you know, with AWRA, AWWA, uh, these organizations that you know deal with you know water purveyors, water suppliers, there's a lot that's being done by water uh, water suppliers uh, with respect to risk management directly triggered by climate change or related to climate change. Thank you. You want to just read them and everybody can read the questions in the chat and Dr. Sousa will respond. And that be a little faster. So are developers required to provide rainfall runoff, uh, rainwater runoff solutions when they've taken down all the trees? Um, have they, uh, do they have to pay attention to existing wetland flags? Who monitors developers destruction while building? So that all gets back to you know your uh, you know your municipality, your building, you know uh, uh, code enforcement officers, the uh, you know the municipal engineer. Um, you can have the best plans, but if they're not being implemented properly, um, you know it, it's just not going to work. So I would say you know all of those things that you just brought up, there's requirements to mitigate those impacts. Um, but you know how well they're implemented is something that falls back on uh, the overview that's being provided by the municipal engineer or the, or the code enforcement officer, whoever it is that has the responsibility of taking what has been uh, you know determined through like a planning review uh, and the developer is supposed to be doing and what actually ends up getting done. Um, but I, I mean that. I don't know what else to say beyond that. I mean, it really falls at that point, you know, at the municipal level. Right, and Lori then wanted to know about how much land can be covered by buildings in a watershed area. She gave the example if a home is yeah. built on a five acre lot. Right, and, that, and that's gonna vary from, you know, a lot of times from 
county to county, municipality to municipality. I mean, depending on what their you know the, their development ordinance you know states. But typically, if you look at what's considered you know low density development, you know even like a four or five acre lot, yeah, you're going to be able to get about thirty percent impervious cover on that on that lot, and um, uh, you know so uh, you still end up. You're still in, ending up even in those, and that's why in suburbia, you still see those impacts. As I, you know, I mentioned in terms of the downcutting of streams because of too much volume, you know, too much, too high a rate of flow, not enough base flow. So, you know, a lot of times, like it, you really need to look not only at the size of the lot and the amount of impervious cover, but the post development practices that are being required for that site. You know, uh, uh, soils required to be decompacted after development. You know, what type of stormwater management is, you know, is, is, is required? Uh, do they have to manage all of the runoff from the one-year event? Um, you know, those are the types of things that, you know, that I try to promote. You know, if, if you can't, like on my, you know, my lot is a half acre lot. Uh, probably right now I'm, I'm at about, 15% impervious cover. Um, I have one, two, three, I've got four rain gardens. I don't have a single downspout that comes off of my roof that doesn't go into a rain garden or into some type of vegetated swale. So my goal on my property, and I have two rain barrels, is to actually, for the one-year event, 2.75 inches over 24 hours, to retain 100% of all that volume on my property. And if everybody could do that, you would reduce the amount of pollutant loading by about 90% just doing that by retaining on your own property that one, the runoff from the one year storm. You know, so for in my, in my situation that equates to maybe about 20,000 gallons, and it sounds like a lot of water, but it can be done. Uh, I don't have a lot of lawn. It only takes me about like 15 minutes to mow my lawn, <laughs> but because I've converted most of it to rain gardens, but uh, it can be done. You know, you can do that. Um, but it's not something that, you know, is, is typical practice. But so in any event, just looking at lot size impervious cover alone can be somewhat misleading. Thank you. And Mandy Fisher has a question. And Mandy, pipe up and correct me if I'm getting this wrong. But I believe what she's asking about is we talked a lot about development that was in the Royal Crescent, which is more the upper reaches of the reservoir watershed. And she wants to know which is more harmful, development in the upper reaches of the watershed or development that's right on the shoreline of the reservoir. Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about like the, you know, which, which is going to result in most likely an immediate observable impact, it's going to be what's happening right along the shoreline, you know. And uh, so, you know, I showed you pictures that again, uh, uh, Nikki had shared with me. Uh, there were pictures around the reservoir of of uh, an extensive amount of vegetative clearing, you know, banks destabilization, uh, things along those lines. Those have immediate uh, measurable impact to the reservoir. You know, uh, you know what's happening further out in in the watershed. Uh, those impacts uh, may not be immediate, but those are like sort of the chronic impacts that build up over time. And especially when you start to convert forested land to large scale development, you know whether it's a data center or warehousing or whatever, we have a lot of impervious cover. You may see those impacts, you know, pretty quickly, even if it's you know an area that's somewhat distant. From the uh, from the reservoir proper, but if you know if you're if, to ask me where you're going to see this impact, you know, uh, uh, the, the most immediate, and that's going to be what's happening right alongside the you know the, the reservoir, and whatever can be done to, you know, to protect or or to avoid that, uh, you're going to have some uh, measurable positive, uh, immediate benefits. Uh, as opposed to what's happening, you know, further out into the watershed. Not saying don't pay any attention to that. Just saying to answer your question directly, yeah, what's happening right alongside the watershed, uh, the the you know the banks of the reservoir, 
you're going to have an immediate impact that you, you already saw some pictures of, you know, the severity of what that, that can do. But can you extrapolate because what you're saying is that changes in the upper reaches of the watershed will just take longer to have an effect, but they would be the chronic, they would, that would be the death of a thousand cuts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what that's what you see time and time again in, you know, in with watershed development, you know, just not for the Aquan Reservoir, but, you know, for every lake community that's out there in reservoir, you know, drinking water system, uh, you know, you get watershed development and you reach that tipping point. Um, and it may not be immediate, but you reach that tipping point and you see, uh, you know, impacts that are very difficult to turn back and, you know, and correct over time. Okay, thank you. Douglas, I see you right there. Do you want to ask your question? I just wanted to ask, um, you mentioned a lot of impacts on, on water and, and implicitly drinking water. And I just wondered if there's been any quantification or analysis of what the costs are of, of added development for for managing the reservoir, for, for providing drinking water for, for the customers? Or if there are other you know, examples of what the benefits have been in avoided costs from what Fairfax County's down zoning has done. But is there any kind of um, analysis on, on that level of what, what costs you know, um, added development um, would, would lead to? Yeah, that I, that I don't know. I mean, that's that's a question for the water authority. To be quite honest with you, um, you know, the drinking water supplier, uh, North Jersey District that I work with, you know, you know, I, my work primarily with them is in algae, harmful algae bloom uh, prevention, and um, you know, for them, they they have quantified what is it what it takes in terms of uh, additional backwashing of their filters, uh, additional, uh, you know, use of permanganate, uh, uh, activated carbon, those costs when they do have an algae bloom, how much extra does it time and uh, uh, material costs associated with responding to that bloom? Because it's cheaper for them to try to manage the raw water quality and maintain the raw water quality as best as possible, uh, as opposed to trying to deal with it in the plant. So I can tell you from my experience with the water supplier that I'm working with right now, they've gone through, you know, an analysis of that type, just in terms of algae. You know, how much extra money and time does it take when we have an algae bloom? Uh, because they have to backwash their filters more frequently. That means filters are taken out of, of uh, circulation. They're using more permanganate. They're using more activated carbon, um, and you know. So there's ways to quantify that. And I think AWWA uh, actually has a program that allows water, you know, water purveyors to analyze different types of scenarios in terms of treatment costs, in-plant treatment costs. Nikki, do you have a comment? Uh, hi, this is Nikki. I work for the for Fairfax Water. Um, my boss would be better um, at answering this question. Um, I do know that we were part of a study for the Potomac River watershed and how treatment costs are impacted by deforestation. I am not aware that we've done a specific study for development impacts of the Aquaquan watershed and how that affects our treatment costs. Um, but I can get back to you on that. Thank you very much. That'd be terrific. And I know that Greg was here last week and he made the comment that regarding the downzoned area, that those streams were some of the most pristine in the county. So he thought that demonstrated it was a good strategy. Elena. You have a question about the sewer gateway. I, sewer gateway to more issues. Do you want to hold no, no, that I, question? Yeah, I know. I was just. I was just. Uh, I put that in the chat to remember exactly what uh, Stephen said okay. about sewer. <laughs> Perfect. 
and Matt Brennan is here with a question again. Um, and he, do you want to ask Matt? I think those were just comments that I had okay. as I was listening. Thank you. And Elizabeth, I know you have a question here. Elizabeth says, today the Aquan Reservoir is the most urbanized reservoir in the nation. It provides 40% of the drinking water for 2 million people. Fairfax Water has $165 million annual revenue. Has Fairfax Water considered purchasing the development rights for the rural crescent? <laughs> Everybody <laughs> loves that question, but um, I could dream. Except Nikki. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> I I honestly don't know the answer to this. Um, we we have done some um, preservation of of shoreland land right adjacent to our dam. So I think the focus is on our direct um, adjacent shoreline. Um, so it I'm has been, but I said maybe, <laughs> maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe you need to look for the future of the health of the watershed for maintaining it as the essential drinking water supply that it is. That's a great comment, Elizabeth. Thank you. And I guess that in some ways is one of the things we're talking about tonight, because what we see happening here, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nikki, is kind of signaling that there's going to be a change in the watershed area. And where is that going to be? How are we going to respond to it? And will we be proactive? Um, Lori? Lori wants to know, she says, what does 20 million square feet of impervious land do to area wells? Will they run dry or impact the recharging of the watershed? I mean, you know, Face value, yeah, it's going to have it's going to have definitely an impact on the uh, recharge of the watershed. Now, depending on you know which aquifer those wells have tapped, how far down, you know, th there's a you know there's a lot of 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 site specific you know conditions. I can tell you with some of the warehouse development that is occurring in central New Jersey, these are farm fields. You know, typically uh, that grew turf. So we're talking about like these rural areas that are now being converted into these large, uh, you know, warehousing facilities. You know, and each, you know, the buildings themselves are probably somewhere in the order of around five to six acres of building alone, with probably an, you know an additional maybe ten acres of you know of of parking uh, for trucks and you know all the rest of that stuff. And typically, the, you know, the give back that, that these developers, you know, they say, yeah, we're going to take you off of wells and because we're bringing in water to our facility, we'll hook you up, you know, to, uh, you know, to a, a public water system. So that, so I would say on face value, it's going to have an impact on how much recharge is going to occur. And that's going to affect primarily the superficial aquifer, what's going to feed the streams it may not affect wells if you know if your well is in a confined aquifer that's say 150 feet below the surface or 200 feet below the surface. Um, but like I've said, you know, I've seen this as a typical developer's ploy that you know when a question like this has come up, that it's like don't worry about it. We're bringing in you know city water. We'll hook you up to city water. You don't have to worry about your well. But Thank I would you. say definitely in terms of recharge. And that superficial aquifer, it's going to have an impact. Thank you. And Matt, is your next one about pre and post construction storm sampling a comment or a question? Uh, that was just another comment as kind of one mechanism okay. for, yeah. Yep, that's and it. Josephine Navini thinks you're terrific yeah. and wants to know if you will do a fourth grade field trip which I'm guessing from New Jersey, that would be hard, but what a compliment. Um, I thought she so was talking Josephine, to you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So you can contact us and we can maybe help um, give you some names and some opportunities and a way to make that happen. You're gonna provide pizza um, and cupcakes? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that works. And Mandy, how can you learn more about Prince William Conservation Alliance? Please contact us and we will connect with you and um, help answer that question. My number is 703-499-4954 and the office is 703-490-5200 and you have our emails from the messages with this. Um, yeah, I saw there was a little comment there about rain gardens. If anybody is, you know, there, there's some great um, manuals. I mean, you can download, there's a great manual that's produced by Rutgers University and uh, Rutgers has a program where they actually go out and they meet with individual homeowners. And in some cases they've done like this rain garden rebate will they'll cover some of the costs of rain gardens, but they have a great manual that you can download from the Rutgers site. So just, you know, Google Rutgers uh, rain garden manual uh, and it covers everything on how to build, design, build, uh, a rain garden. And then there's actually an app if anybody is, you know, interested in, in this app. It's from University of Connecticut. Uh, again, you can just, it's called My Rain Garden. And uh, you can just go in, Google that again. And it's actually an app you can put on your smartphone. I have it on my phone. Uh, but it basically tells you all the, you know, how to design, build, what plants to choose, how to install it, etc. So it's a pretty cool little app. Um, and that's available through the University of Connecticut. Thank you very much. I Back when you were talking about your yard with um, rain barrels and um, rain gardens, which I think is such a great combination. I remember when I put in my first rain barrel, which was a 60 gallon rain barrel, which I figured was gonna really help a lot and you know take care of all that. And it started raining and like 10 minutes later, it was fall. <laughs> it was full. Yeah. yeah. But I know one of the things myself and another professor from Rutgers, we, we call like rain barrels, like, like sort of like the gateway drug to small <laughs> water management. Because somebody yeah. puts in a rain barrel, then they get really excited about, hey, look, I can do something. And then next thing you know, they've got two. Then they're saying, hey, yeah, I'd like to build a rain garden. And so it's sort of like a, a good way to get people involved uh, with managing, you know, stormwater on their own property. And yeah, it doesn't, it, it doesn't hold a lot. I've got two that are about a hundred, each is about a hundred gallons, but I don't, you know, I use it to water my vegetable gardens and, you know, we've got a lot of flowers and like my, you know, my rain gardens look like landscaped features. So I use the water from that to, you know, a lot of times to, to irrigate when we're not getting any, you know, rainfall. But, and then you know, just, I'll put a little plug in for us in the spring around the time of the Bluebell Festival, we have a local artist who hand paints a scene on a, a 60 gallon rain barrel and we raffle it off. It's hugely popular. And they are, it's a great way to add a little bit of art into your garden also. Um, everybody thinks it's great. And um, am I missing, what am I missing? Norm Goulet gave a link on rain gardens. Okay. Yes. Do you have any comments on rain gardens, Norm? You've been so quiet. I'm doing that on purpose tonight. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I mean, the rain gardens are great. I mean, we, we do, um, as a matter of fact, if you go to that link, you'll see a, a video recording that you can sit down and watch at your leisure on, on rain gardens. Uh, a quick uh, Google for Fairfax. County and rain gardens will give you a, a design manual uh, that Fairfax has put together. Um, that's that's fairly easily understandable. Uh, the biggest problem with rain gardens are actually two. One is uh, the average homeowner coming in and trying to do some maintenance of those. Uh, usually ends up screwing it up, screwing them up. And the second biggest problem is when the house is sold from one person to another. The new owner comes in and says, what the hell is this? And <laughs> usually they're gone. Uh, that's, the, that's the biggest problem with, uh, you know, on-site rain gardens. But other than that, yeah, they're absolutely great. Um, you know, I, I know of a, a, a whole handful of people that have put them in, in in their own individual yards and have gotten rid of, you know, the down spots that come with them. Uh, right. You just, you just need to follow a little bit of guidance and you can do your own. Maybe we'll start a fad here. 
or a craze. Well, thank you very much. If anybody, last call for comments, if anybody has any. Um, Marilyn. Marilyn. Yes, we have been asking for a water study. We're blue in the face. But how much, how much good can getting the results of the water study be in this whole subject about, you know, our drinking water? Is it worth really pushing them for? Yeah, I mean, I think that's another question that would have to leave, you know, for either, you know, the North Virginia Regional Commission or, you know, Fairfax Water Authority, you know, for them to answer that question. I'm not, I can't answer that question myself, but, um, you know, there's power in data. That's what I always say. And having, you know, having monitoring programs and being able to track you know, quality and, you know, and obviously there's, you know, th there's already data that is being collected on a regular basis. Um, th there's power in all of that data. So uh, maybe Adil could, you know, address some of that because, uh, th you know, they've collected some great data over the years. Oh, absolutely. Adil, you have comments of your own. You still with us, Adele? Hand up. We've seen rain gardens being used uh, because of the way they were offset below the grade of the regular uh, yard. They were being used to, uh, uh, as a skateboarding area. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was large enough and the kids were going wild on those things. <laughs> and they didn't understand. This goes to Norm's comment about a new owner comes in, doesn't know what this is and let the kids do what they want. And they've also been turned into rose gardens with rose bushes growing in them. So we've seen all kinds of stuff like that, you know, in the field. Uh, the other thing, the other comment was about the uh, business of Fairfax Water purchasing the Rural Crescent. Uh, they, as far as I know, you know, they're a nonprofit uh, public agency. I'm not sure how much money they can expend on that uh, because <coughs> I remember the, uh, you know, way back when, when you also, the Upper Aquan Service Authority was formed. Um, everybody knew how much their bills were going to go up, and that caused a huge furor. Not every jurisdiction was happy about that, and it was sort of the State Water Control Board said, no, this is going to happen. So there was a lot of pressure from the State Water Control Board that pushed that through. But there were many jurisdictions who were saying, we are unwilling to raise our sewer prices by that much to support this thing. Uh, even today, I see people saying, when new people who move into this area say, wow, what is this Yosa fee that we all pay? What, why is this sewer uh, treatment price so high? Uh, if you see that sort of stuff on your water bill, pretty soon somebody's going to complain about that. The other option, I think, is if we want to protect this, it's got to come from us, not from FX Water or somebody else. We've got to do it ourselves. And, and whether you elect people or whether you do whatever you want, but at the end of the day, we are going to pay for it, and it's got to come from uh, from the public. Otherwise, you don't get public support. Um, typically, you have somebody, uh, an entity, um, saying that we want to do this, and and the, the, the shareholders, uh, the board, is going to say, "Wait a minute, how can we justify this expense?" It's really difficult to do that. So I was just going to throw those comments in. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not speaking on behalf of Fairfax or anybody else. I'm, that's a general comment. Um, that was really a great way of looking at things. And I hope that this program and our conversation here can yeah. help us go down that path. That's the main then that's the main utility of these kinds of programs is make people aware it's not you know, and bring in people who are beyond simply the people who are already in involved in this uh, and, and persuade them. This is in your own benefit. You know, you Oh, you, it is. You don't uh, you don't let, let your dog run wild in the backyard endlessly without cleaning up. Same thing. You don't develop endlessly without fixing the problem. Right. At some point. Thank you very much, Adele, for those wise words. Much appreciated. Additional comments. Again, last chance. Tim, you know, everybody, I mean, you have my email address was on the last slide as well. And I think on the first slide, 
but if people do think of something else that they want to Kevin did. You know, ask me, they could either reach out directly to me or they can, you know, contact you and then you can contact me, but I'd be more than happy to, uh, you know, to get back to people, at, you know, at a later date. Thank you so much. And your presentation was just terrific. And the, the questions really were relevant and I appreciate the attention you paid to them. Did, did you have something, Kevin, or not? Yeah, Kevin was trying to raise his hand or something, I think, Kim. Maybe he can unmute himself. Well, I've asked him, yeah, a few times. We can't hear you, you're on mute. Oh my. So maybe we can get Kevin in writing later on. You're on mute, Kevin. We can't hear you. Kevin, you could type in the chat also. Right. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Oh, here he goes. Oh, he still can't hear. We still can't hear you. I can't. Sounds like technical difficulties. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Maybe we can ask this afterwards, Kevin. I can't hear you. But Dr. Souza, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to work with you. And oh, same um, here. It'd be great to have you back. Maybe you can do a field trip for all of us. <laughs> thank you. You're a treasure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, and again, you know, thanks for having me this evening. And uh, hope there's, you know, at least, you know, one or two things that you can take away and, you know, make use of uh, in a positive way. But again, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. And thank you to Fairfax Water and, and Nikki in particular, and Adele Nock, Juan Watershed Monitoring Lab, and Norm with the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, because I think you added a lot to the programs between you know last Monday and tonight and your support for healthier watersheds and protecting our public drinking water is really uh, much appreciated and very well received by us all. So thanks to Thank everyone. You. Thank you yeah. very much. Great program, Kim, once again. Thank you. We'll right. see you all soon. See Thank you later. You. Okay, we'll bye. send the chat out with the follow-up email. Great program. Yep. Thank you. Oh, there's my hands. Bye, everybody. <laughs>